Hi, thanks so much for having us both. Uh, I'll start speaking first, and then Dr. Gang will join about halfway through. Um, consultative medicine is the name of our clinic here at Stanford. Uh, we both work in this, and this was founded first by Bryant Lynn uh, about five years ago. And it was a uh, kind of an, uh, a need that he saw um, in the patient population that wasn't being filled. And it's for how do we diagnose and help patients with complex disease. How I got involved was um, I was chatting about a really kind of a elusive case of a patient I had just met who was convinced she had a disorder, um, had multiple specialists tell her it wasn't true, went to another institution, it turns out it wasn't true. Um, you know, I, I, I just kind of gave her story some credence and then uh, researching, well, there are case reports of really rare presentations that only you can sample at night. So then we sent some nighttime testing, came back positive, um, and since then uh, she went to surgery. So once Bryant knew that I kind of had a passion for digging a little deeper in these cases, uh, he invited me to join him in the clinic. And Dr. Gang, uh, who will speak shortly, um, has kind of a, always had a, a passion uh, for mystery diagnoses and kind of complex disease. Um, just a brief overview of kind of the agenda, um, kind of a general overview of diagnosing, why we diagnose, how we diagnose, kind of the thought process in the clinic. Um, and then I'll go over kind of some of the case examples. Some of these will be pretty simple. Um, some of these are examples of complex pathology and also what we've seen here in the diagnostic consultative medicine. Um, and then uh, Linda will go over the programs at Stanford and also kind of nationwide and where there's overlap between consultative medicine and these other kind of mystery diagnosis clinics as well. Um, does anyone happen to know uh, this? You always have to keep an old historical photo. Uh, does anyone know this person? Hippocrates. Oh my gosh, uh, fantastic. Yeah, Hippocrates, uh, 10 points. Um, so this is uh, quite a number of years ago. Some would say the father of medicine, but others say that's Osler's title is father of medicine. Um, but really kind of uh, helped kind of create diagnosis and treatment plans and some of the adjectives we still use today. Um, so, uh, you know, he was one of the first people to say disease occurs naturally. So these aren't uh, curses or kind of gods uh, afflicting you. This is some kind of imbalance within the human body. Um, maybe it's environmental, maybe it's something you ate, maybe it's emotional, but there's an imbalance within the human body and that's how we're gonna treat it, um, separating kind of the more spiritual side of medicine. Um, the criticism of Hippocrates is that there was more of a passive uh, approach to treatment. So it was a generalized uh, illness. Oh, you are tired, I don't know why, but I'm just gonna give you some food, some rest, um, decrease your stress, hopefully you get better. And so this would happen with many different ailments. And so that was, that was a kind of a criticism because there's another school of thought at this time that felt that specific diagnoses was ultimately the way to treat. If you can pinpoint a specific diagnosis, you can target your treatment, rudimentary compared to what we have today, but that was the thought process. And he kind of had a more uh, generalized approach. Um, uh, humorism may be something that you're aware of, the four kind of humors of the body, um, these kind of parallel uh, water, fire, kind of the elements. Um, and again, there's some imbalance, we don't know what, but here are some things we can try to have you rest and you'll get better. So the reason I even mention this is, I think in a lot of cases for simple diagnoses, um, this holds true. Uh, for a lot of the time, the normal curve, kind of a bell curve, I, I find applies to everything in life. Uh, it applies to medicine, treatments, um, you know, bike riding, everything you can think of is the normal curve. The vast majority of us will be within the middle or at least one deviation. It's rare to have uh, findings uh, three or more standard deviations, and that's just statistics. Um, so I would say that Hippocrates kind of had a point for simple problems. Most of the time, rest and patients are gonna get better. Um, and this is you know, supplemented by a good physical exam and a good history. So a patient comes in with fever, sore throat, cough, it's been one week, sick toddler at home, exam, there's nothing concerning. Yeah, most of the time this is a viral upper respiratory infection. Go home, uh, let the evil humors rebalance and you're gonna be okay. Um, could it be bacterial and you're being fooled? Yes, 
but that's kind of uh, much less common as long as you have these supporting features in your history and your exam. Uh, a classic case I, I saw in this clinic, uh, sorry, in our internal medicine clinic, but not the consultative clinic, um, shooting pain down the leg, um, thought to be sciatica. Um, most of the time, that's absolutely what it is, the, the vast majority of the time. However, in this case, it turned out to be shingles. So a few days later, uh, the patient presented again with the pain, but this time a severe rash. So you can be fooled. Um, it's just, it's gonna be the minority of the time. Um, I kind of have a few other examples. Uh, for knee pain, um, most of the time, it's either a ligament injury or meniscus injury. It could be something more malignant, uh, osteochondroma or osteosarcoma. I, I have yet to see that, but something you keep in the back of your head. And as we go about di diagnosis, Part of the key elements um, are gonna be revisiting your diagnosis and seeing if the patient improves. So that's kind of the overview of the history of diagnosis. Why do we diagnose? Um, I would say there's a few key reasons. One is understanding the course of an ailment or disease. So if I can say this patient meets criteria for diabetes, I know that you have an elevated cardiovascular risk. I know that you're at risk for retinopathy, kidney disease, neuropathy, and it helps us not just diagnose one problem, but all the other associated problems that come with an illness. And by virtue of that, we can keep a, a much better eye on the patient. Uh, treatment, more and more tailored therapy as we've kind of moved up with technology, genomics, uh, testing, we can tailor specific therapies based on the specific patient and the disease they have. Um, one example would be right now antidepressants. Someone's depressed, we kind of try an antidepressant. Um, one day we'll have targeted personalized medicine and we'll know which of these antidepressants will work well. Uh, another clear example is hematology and oncology. Rather than just giving everyone the same kind of cytotoxic chemotherapy, now we can say, oh, this uh, AML mutation requires this regimen, so much more targeted. And lastly, uh, patient you know, uh, prognosis and expectations. Um, you know, the, the element of the unknown is really uh, difficult for a lot of patients. Um, and it's difficult for the doctor as well. We're both frustrated. So being able to say, I expect you to get better within six to 12 months, and here's our course, uh, is part of the healing process, understanding the disease and explaining it. So how do we diagnose? Very, very basic. Um, you do a history, you do a physical, uh, and you do labs. Um, just to expand on this, so why do we still do a history? Um, the history is still performed because you can actually include and exclude multiple diagnoses with just doing a very basic uh, history. So a classic example is syncope, or uh, blacking out or fainting. Um, we found that often when someone blacks out, they go to the ER, they get uh, a dozen tests that cost $15,000, and uh, it doesn't really change anything. So the vast majority of the time, you can actually, and they've studied this numerous times, you can actually tell what happened and why the patient blacked out solely from the history. So the history actually accounts for a lot, and I have a case of that uh, coming up later where I also ordered unnecessary tests. Uh, the exam, this is an interesting point. I admit during my residency, I didn't appreciate it as much because we are surrounded by technology. Uh, now there's uh, a lot more push to go back to the physical exam. So Abraham Verghese here teaches at Stanford 25. It's all about, um, kind of recognizing and appreciating key physical exam findings. And this is a really important issue because if we don't do this now, it's gonna eventually become kind of the blind leading the blind. If my physical exam is a, is a poor uh, accuracy, I'm gonna teach the next generation very poorly as well. And it's just gonna continue to uh, dissolve. And then how do we diagnose, of course, labs, imaging, procedures? We'll get to those uh, in a little bit, but it's kind of, um, it's a blessing and a curse. Uh, a lot of these labs, images, and procedures, yes, they can help you with a diagnosis, but they can also kind of haunt you with red herrings, false results, um, patients get anxious, I get anxious, and we're ordering unnecessary tests that don't actually change management. I, I put this uh, extra large. I think that for me, this is the most key feature that I've learned uh, in consultative medicine. Um, it's to reevaluate the patient. I have yet to kind of crack a case with just one appointment. 
and this goes for my own patients as well as consultative patients. It really requires uh, multiple investigations and keeping in close contact with patients. And I feel that's probably the most important part. You can empirically treat people, see if they get better, um, but if they don't, you need to reevaluate what's going on. So I, I, I felt, at first I didn't have this slide, um, but I felt like I needed something on the differential diagnosis. Are any of you familiar with this uh, differential diagnosis? Not so much. So this is something we're taught and trained in medical school. Um, basically, it's a systematic way of considering all possibilities for an ailment. So this is just one example at the bottom. Um, all the bold letters spell out vindicated. And it's just a mnemonic to yeah, make sure you're vindicated from missing a diagnosis. Um, so, oh, this patient has abdominal pain. Is this a vascular issue, inflammatory infection? Is it cancer? Is it degenerative? And so it's a pretty exhaustive list to go through. But if you do it, you don't miss anything. Um, in reality, we have uh, not a lot of time to do this. And um, you know, there's, again, the bell curve. Most of the time, it's within that bell curve. So you don't need to consider every possibility. So what does this look like in a typical office visit? Um, patient comes in with a symptom. Again, I keep saying abdominal pain. That's a very common one. Um, you sit down, and just based on the patient age, their symptoms, oh, the abdominal pain is on the left, and maybe how they look you already have your probability of diagnosis. So it's, it's not a very sound one, but you still have expectations. Oh, I think it could be diverticulitis, uh, acid reflux, or biliary. Um, then you sit down, you chat with the patient, and we'll get to this later, but time is a key factor. In most patient visits, this is only 20 minutes. In the consultative medicine, uh, we've been lucky enough to be given 60 minutes, and that makes a huge difference. Um, and now I have my post-history probabilities. So I'm sitting there, I'm typing up what the patient is telling me, and now I have a couple ideas of what this could be even more. I have them sit down, I perform an exam. Uh, now I have my post-exam probabilities as well. And so you could imagine this typically might start broad and then narrow as you go, or converse. There are many, many times I've had uh, a very narrow uh, onset of what I think is going on, and then the patient will say something that surprises me, they're tender in a place that surprises me, and then I have to actually go back and reevaluate everything. And that's actually happened to me numerous times, and so uh, I really find this process of constantly changing your probabilities uh, in incredibly important. What about testing? Uh, as I said, blessing and a curse. Um, these are some statistical acronyms, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, um, what is your likelihood ratio? What's the sensitivity, specificity? These are all uh, somewhat intrinsic characteristics of a single test. So if you're gonna test for inflammatory markers, um, it's not very specific, but it's very sensitive. So if there's something going on, we will detect it. But if there's uh, anything going on and we don't know why, it's gonna be positive as well. And so that's the tricky part of testing. Um, it's not always clear, is this test gonna change management? Is this test accurate? And then there's a whole kind of series of Bayesian uh, statistics where you could say that based on my pretest probability and the likelihood ratio of this test, will this change what I expect or not? And then it determines what test you should order. So that, that's kind of a whole talk onto itself. But I did just want to mention the pitfalls with testing, but also, also you know, uh, have their utility as we'll go over in some cases. Um, what, I, I had to include something for TV. Um, so that's kind of my uh, very lengthy explanation of what I do in clinic. Um, on, on TV, it's a lot cleaner, it's a lot uh, nicer. You have this uh, curmudgeon who you know, barges into houses and figure, uh, figures out the case um, kind of by his own intellect. Um, this is a pretty good show, Dr. Gang told me about diagnosis. It does go over kind of more of the process. I would say check it out if you have it on Netflix. Um, mostly the patient perspective and what we're talking about today is more our perspective. I didn't even know this one existed. It's a mystery diagnosis show on the uh, Oprah Winfrey net Network, I think. Um, it's been out since 2005. Um, the Good Doctor, uh, I believe this is Amazon. Um, I could only really take one episode because uh, he was doing some egregious procedures. But again, it's kind of the savant, this genius who figures out cases because they're so um, uh, clever and so knowledgeable. 
I think my point of this is that these are all, whether, whether pretty good uh, accuracy or not, these are all one episode. Um, someone's sick, within 60 minutes, they kind of figure it out, whether from their own acumen or otherwise. Um, our process is a lot more labor intensive, um, and I think that's the reality of it. You know, for example, Mayo Clinic, which Linda will speak about, you know, that you go there for several days and you're seen by multiple specialists. So it's, it's not as clean um, and tidy. Um, so this all, I guess my, my initial box outline sounds pretty simple. Um, so uh, why is this difficult? Why, why are we even speaking to this? Um, I'll go through each of these a little individually, but it's because we, we lack time. Um, sometimes we lack knowledge. Uh, we have biases, and that's again a whole talk on its own. Um, data and red herrings, we've already discussed a little bit. And there are some ailments and diseases, uh, much more of the consultative medicine complex disease that we just don't know about. These are unknown diseases. Um, so lack time. Uh, your appointment is 20 minutes, typically. So if it's a simple symptom, um, that could be adequate, but that's difficult. Um, patient arrives late, you're running late, you have that much less time. Um, often for the complex ailments, there's multiple symptoms. So now it's not just one symptom in 20 minutes, it's, it's, it's a lot of symptoms in 20 minutes. Um, on average, depending on which study you look at, doctors interrupt patients anywhere from 18 seconds to 30 seconds in. So that's in less than one minute, the patient's been interrupted. And historically, as I was saying, a lot of the clues to the patient's ailments are in the history. So once you interrupt them, whatever story was coming out is kind of lost forever. And I, again, that's kind of, there's a time pressure, the clock's ticking, you have to see your next patient. Um, again, kind of the, the labor intensive part of consultative medicine, these symptoms uh, often for patients, uh, I saw one that started age 15, now 25. I've seen patients for decades with symptoms. So again, it's really hard to uh, consolidate that in a, tw a simple 20 minute visit. Um, review of records, uh, occasionally I'll have patients come, often I'll have patients come in with a shoebox of records. And so I, I actually do go through those. Um, uh, a few times, and I'll, I'll mention one case, I've been surprised by finding some imaging result from uh, two decades ago, and it changes management. So there are uh, utility in those records, but that's um, not even one hour would cover that. And then lastly, uh, and ag again, another huge pearl is just reading and thinking. Um, you can't bill for thinking, unfortunately. Um, so that's, you know, there, there's no time for that. Um, during lunch, there's meetings. And so when do you actually have time to sit and think about patients? Again, there's kind of a, a romantic idea about that and perhaps a lost art. Um, Dr. Kelly Skeff is looking into this a little bit, what doctors miss about medicine. And some of that is learning and researching and thinking, because now there's no time. We're typing, we're billing, and then it's off to the next patient. Um, lack of knowledge, um, a rare diagnosis. So a rare diagnosis by definition is rare. So you might not have seen it. Um, I, I saw a patient with a today a diagnosis. Um, well, I think it's the diagnosis, but something I've never seen and I learned about in med school 10 years ago. So these, these one-off diagnoses are very difficult. And so if you're not constantly seeing them, it's hard to really characterize them in person. And some of these you've never seen, so how are you gonna know? Um, another very tricky one that I see very frequ frequently, and we have kind of one case uh, coming up, atypical pre presentation of a common ailment. So a lot of patients with, um, uh, let's say, inflammation of their foot, um, gout will present in their first toe or their ankle, but occasionally it can be the midfoot, and that can be tricky to pick up. And so it, it'll be missed. They'll get antibiotics, they'll get ultrasounds, they'll get x-rays. Really all they need is an anti-gout medication. So it's a kind of a one-off atypical presentation. And then, um, you know, uh, there's a little bit of, we have subspecialists, sub-subspecialists. Uh, you know, we have our eye institute here, the amazing work. I think there's one person who just does uh, freckles of your eye. And then, so, so it's a very narrow window. And so when I refer someone to a specialist, and they say there's nothing wrong, or um, they give their opinion, but the patient feels like there's something else going on. How much do you argue, push back? Am I qualified to read an echocardiogram or pulmonary function studies? Um, yeah, it's part of the training, and I think if you have a passion for it, you're gonna learn um, what is correct. 
Um, I've read our echocardiograms and changed the diagnosis. I've looked at pulmonary function studies, changed the diagnosis. So there's a little bit of, we rely heavily on our specialists, but um, it also requires a little more training and a little more knowledge to be able to kind of push them uh, if you think there's something else going on. Cognitive biases, another really tough reason why we struggle uh, with these complex diagnoses. Uh, availability bias, um, this is uh, kind of as it sounds, the, you judge uh, a case based on what's most available in your own memory. So the, the most classic example is I just saw a case of disease X, a patient comes in, the first thing I think of is disease X. Uh, that's just more available in my cortex. Um, the anchoring bias, um, I, I hear some salient features early on in the case. Oh, that sounds like disease Y. And then uh, you can basically ignore a lot of the other uh, symptoms and signs that come up throughout the case. And so you kind of anchored onto your initial diagnosis. Very common pitfall. Again, I've been surprised numerous times. Ascertainment bias, um, this is your uh, it, almost like stereotyping, you hear the symptom, you might see an age or you might see a gender or whatnot, shoes, and you kind of come up with an a priori assumption without even getting a history or an exam. So always a dangerous bias. Um, confirmation bias, you're basically looking for clues within the history and exam that confirm what you already think. Um, and the gambler's bias, uh, there's, you know, dozens of biases. These are just examples. Gambler's bias is when you um, are predicting a future event based on past probabilities, even if they're two independent features. So the classic example, I toss a coin four times, it's head every time. What's the next one? Um, people would predict, oh, it's going to change, or maybe it's going to be the same. It's completely random. So these are separate occurrences. Um, I'll, I'll try to go through this one pretty quickly because we've already kind of talked about this a little bit. Red herrings, um, CT scans, uh, everyone gets one. The first time I meet you, I'll order one. I, 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 uh, all patients will eventually get a CT scan, unfortunately. About 1% will show an adrenal uh, nodule that most likely has no meaning. So about one in 100, and we do hundreds of these. Um, thyroid nodules, very common. I feel them on exam. 95% of these are benign. So 95% of patients, um, with a nodule, it's nothing. But it does cause some anxiety and it does cause kind of a red herring often. And then more imaging, uh, pituitary uh, adenomas, about one in 10 will have some abnormality if you look at their pituitary. But clinically, it's about one in 1,000 that it has any meaning. Um, and pulmonary nodules, anywhere from 10 to 50%. And then there's a much more common imaging that throws us off. Patient with knee pain gets an MRI. Well, there's degeneration. We all kind of have de degeneration. Same with the spine. So there's a lot of common findings in imaging that can often throw us off. Uh, I just wanted to do a quick data uh, example. This was pretty recent. Um, sorry, it's so small. So this is some lab results. Two doctors had ordered labs on a patient. These are both drawn at 1.31 PM. And so we had two sets of results because these were both sent to the lab. This is a basic chemistry panel. Um, it's hard to tell, but there's about six out of the 10 um, are slightly off. So, they, and these are decimal places, but still, um, the calcium's a little off, the anion gap's a little off, um, the bicarb's a little off. And so, although clinically that might not be relevant, if there's a red arrow next to that, if it just happens to be 4.6 instead of 4.5, well, now there's a red arrow. What are we gonna do about that? And so this just goes to show you, even in just basic routine labs sent at the exact same time, there's error. Um, depending on which articles you cite, five to 10% of labs can have some error. So if you get a full yearly physical lab, there's gonna be errors in there. Um, this is an example of the patient's thyroid, 5.21 versus 5.18. So again, slightly off, but still off. Um, lipid panel, a direct versus fasting. Uh, the LDL, 154 versus 122 and so on and so forth. So even in the same patient, there's, there's always some room for error. And that's kind of what we're fighting against is um, so-called bad data. The unknown, I won't spend much time on this. Um, Linda will speak to this and she's an expert, but essentially um, diagnoses that we don't even know about. We don't have a name. We don't know the genetics. This is kind of falls under the umbrella of UDN, um, Undiagnosed Disease Network. And um, you know, these are uh, a subset of patients, even more rare, even more off the, um, the, the curve, but still they do exist. 
Um, and so you send them for genetic testing, genome sequencing, things that are much more involved. Um, there's patients who uh, I think often we say haven't declared themselves. So some mystery diagnosis. Um, it seems like there's something rheumatologic often going on or perhaps you know, some other disorder infectious, but they don't fit the syndrome at this time. You know, we have very standardized diagnostic criteria for different ailments. And if a patient doesn't meet those criteria, we can't fully declare them to have that illness. And so that's kind of another subset of patients. So I have patients who I suspect a certain illness, but since they don't meet the criteria, we don't do treatment because the treatment has pretty harsh side effects. So you're kind of watching and waiting, again, following up every six months. And there's very much puzzling situations. I've had a handful of consultative patients who had something, clearly there's something abnormal going on, lasted a number of years, fully resolved. Um, what it is, I, I, I don't know. Um, I've sent them for testing. The answer is never really clear. And so kind of going back to the prognosis and expectations part, it's frustrating for the patient, it's frustrating for me. Um, they you know, often left with health anxiety because they're unsure of what happened. Uh, and you know, the, I just try to help them through that. So the diagnostic process, um, brief overview as we talk about simple pathology, based on history and exam, most of the time you're gonna fall into the bell curve. More complex, we're going through this um, uh, algorithm and then we're gonna keep doing it over and over again. But the, the, I wanted to just drive home it's so difficult because it does take a lot of time, it does take a good amount of reading, and it takes a good relationship. Again, everyone's gonna be frustrated if you can't figure out a mystery diagnosis. Um, it's frustrating for the doctor, we, wanted, we went to med school for a reason. Um, it's frustrating for the patient, they don't feel good, they're suffering, um, they feel helpless. So now uh, I'll just go over some really simple case examples um, and then hand things over. Um, kind of going over, um, I think, some of the key features I discussed about what makes this kind of hard and what we kind of do uh, in the latter example. So this patient came in, uh, saw someone else, painful ear, um, was camping, kind of woke up, oh, my ear hurts, recalls uh, a spider bite and two mosquito bites, um, kind of has this kind of swollen area. Um, it was red, it was painful. Oftentimes after um, an arthropod or an insect bite, you can get uh, local cellulitis, so they're given antibiotics to help with that. And the key was the, the doctor told them, follow up with your doctor in a few days. So I saw the patient about a week later. Um, yeah, the, the ear was a little swollen, and I could see maybe where the spider bite was, um, but maybe a couple other red dots. And then I kind of took a step back, and I kind of noticed his midline face was a little asymmetric and he had a couple red dots around his mouth and actually inside his mouth that he didn't even know about. Anyone have any guesses? Stroke? Oh, that's, a gr that's actually a great guess. So yes, uh, one side paralysis, absolutely you should consider stroke. I think I heard someone whispering the shing shingles. Oh great, fantastic, yeah. So it's, a, and it's specifically the syndrome we're talking about is Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. Um, and so this is, uh, you have a viral, re a viral reactivation um, and it affects kind of uh, one of your facial nerves. And you wanna treat these patients pretty aggressively because you can get a persistent paralysis unless, uh, if you miss the diagnosis. Um, so this is from the varicella zoster virus. Uh, again, he had this vesicular rash and otalgia or ear pain. Um, so I said, stop your antibiotics, let's get you on steroids and uh, antivirals. Uh, he improved. Um, why, why mention this case? Again, it's the reevaluation. Um, I was Monday morning quarterback. I could see how the patient was a few days later. That gave me all the clues. But this is somewhat of an uncommon diagnosis, Ramsey Hunt. It's much more common to just get shingles on your trunk or your leg, et cetera. This is somewhat uncommon. And um, I was lucky enough in medical school to have a, a doctor pull me in into a room to show me Ramsey Hunt. And so 10 years later, I see a patient and I think, oh yeah, Ramsey Hunt um, for medical school. So again, it's just, if you know about it, um, you'll be able to recognize it. But if it's rare and you haven't seen it, then, then it's a very difficult diagnosis in some ways. Um, false testing, another interesting case. Pa patient had intermittent cyclic vomiting, uh, nausea, stomach pain. Um, would occur and then go away a few days, come back, go away. Had it been a few weeks. Um, tried some home remedies, they didn't really work. Uh, in clinic, examine the patient. Yeah, some, some pain in this area. Um, sent my basic labs, which have their errors, but they were all normal. 
liver, uh, you know, bilirubin, um, kidneys, et cetera. You know, sent urine testing for kidney stone, everything looked good. So most classically in a patient with kind of this pain and vomiting, you're thinking gallbladder. So we got an ultrasound. Gallbladder looked fine actually, no stones. Liver looked fine. Um, so then uh, I obtained a HIDA scan because uh, a few years ago I was taking my boards and there was a question uh, just like this about a patient with these symptoms. Uh, normal ultrasound, what do you do? The answer was HIDA scan, which is a measure of gallbladder function. Is it contracting appropriately and getting out all of its contents, or is it having some kind of hiccup, even without gallstones, and that's causing the pain and vomiting? Um, unfortunately, it was normal. So I, I, I told the patient in the room uh, somewhat uh, arrogantly, oh, I know this, it's a board question. I've seen this before, don't worry. So I, I sent the patient for a HIDA scan, it was normal, and I'm, I'm often wrong. Um, <laughs> So I, so I sent the patient to a specialist, which completely makes sense to help us. And um, the diagnosis uh, was kind of a, a vague diagnosis. Said, look, I'm not sure, but just monitor. You know, um, It was kind of a, a, a more um, benign diagnosis. But I thought this was really, really strange that this patient had this and it was unclear. Again, I'm, I'm not a specialist, but I, I pulled up her HIDA scan. This is not it, this is just an example of a HIDA scan. Um, and actually in the, in the kind of the text, it turns out that the uh, technician had not had the chemical they normally give to get a full gallbladder contraction. And then just reading the literature, um, if you don't have that uh, chemical to give to the patient, then the sensitivity of this test drops dramatically. So although I normally am reassured by this, in this case, we, we could say, hey, this was a false negative, I suspect. And so, um, you know, we, I said, this is most likely still your gallbladder. I think this uh, HIDA scan was inaccurate because they didn't deliver CCK, and then we had a, a bad test. So I sent her over to surgery. They had her gallbladder removed. We didn't do any more testing, just a clinical diagnosis. And the gallbladder removed, she's perfectly fine. So she's been, you know, um, quite a while now without any symptoms. So again, kind of red herring, bad data, looking into the test results yourself. Always tricky, a little bit time consuming. Um, this, uh, this is a, an example of kind of the patient's story, frankly the history. Again, um, patient came to an outside hospital, had some facial swelling that was quite noticeable and arm swelling that was quite noticeable. A whole uh, smattering of tests were done there, imaging, et cetera. Um, they did find some narrowing of the subclavian, so a stent was placed to help open it up. Um, and when the resident was presenting this case, that's exactly the same thing I thought. Face and arm, that's SVC syndrome, there's something blocking here, and so you get fluid backing up. So they stented it open, patient went home. A few weeks later, oh geez, swelling is now everywhere. Um, it's my arms, my legs. Goes back to a hospital, gets a full cardiac workup, uh, echo, um, cardiac cath with uh, contrast, et cetera, normal, goes home. Um, now comes to our clinic a few weeks later. Hey, I'm still really swollen, and we sent some labs and liver enzymes are very elevated. Um, so at that time, given the swelling, uh, elevated liver enzymes, I thought to myself, this patient has uh, acute liver failure. Go to the ER, this is your liver, absolutely. Because um, I've seen that before, and that's what it looked like. Um, that same day, or that, that night I called the patient and said go to the ER. The next day, I was having lunch in my office, um, and I was reading a book that Dr. Gang had recommended to me, uh, Every Patient Tells a Story by Lisa Sanders. Um, and uh, it was kind of going over the physical exam and listening to the patient, and it was just the chapter I happened to read. Um, and the, Lisa Sanders often mentions uh, Osler, again, a father of medicine. Listen to your patient, he's telling you the diagnosis. And that really kind of struck me. I, I think, again, I just seen this patient and this kind of moved move me in a sense. And I thought back to what the patient told me. I had a rash on my forehead and then I had swelling or weakness. I, I'll be honest, I completely ignored the rash first and then the rest of this. I saw a swollen patient due to those biases. I saw the liver, I came up with my own conclusion. So I went back that night and I re-examined the patient. Um, yeah, this, there is clearly a rash. Um, there's a rash on the hands. Um, there's weakness on exam. Um, these are just uh, kind of uh, example images, not from the patient. So that's kind of the rash, the, the bumps on the hand. Um, these are the kind of swollen eyelids. She, she had all of this. Um, uh, hyperpigmented lesion with specific hypopigmented spots in between. Um, this tells you everything. And so uh, with a better investigation, myself, the other doctors, without any imaging or testing, 
could have probably diagnosed this case. Um, it was dermatomyositis. So when I went back that night uh, to re-examine her and I, I saw those features, then, then I, I said, oh yeah, that's exactly what it was. Um, and she saw rheumatology and they confirmed the diagnosis. Um, apparently the rash then muscle weakness is classic for this disorder. So really if I had listened to the patient, I should have thought of that right away. Same with all, same with all the physicians. Um, what happened with her? Uh, immunosuppression, uh, starting to improve swelling going down. Um, this was a humbling case, as they all are, um, mainly for one reason. I consulted the smartest doctor I know, Dr. Google. If you type in <laughs> rash, then muscle weakness, the first thing is dermatomyositis. So the Dr. Google came up with the diagnosis, and I, I was just humbled by that. I listened to the patient, the, hist the diagnosis in the history. Um, Sorry, I've been going a little slow. I'll go a little faster here. This is, uh, so now it says consultative medicine. So this is more of our consult cases, which are much more chronic. These have all been within the order of weeks or even days. This is much more of a chronic case that we normally see. Um, a patient with a history of chest pain, as you could imagine, chest pain serious, numerous uh, tests evaluated by cardiologists. Um, it's unclear what's going on, told to take ibuprofen. Um, maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't. This is pretty debilitating. Comes out of nowhere, lasts a few days, goes away for months at a time. It's really just plaguing this poor patient. Um, and so he's a little frustrated. Ibuprofen's not working. What do I do? Um, so I put in chest pain in Dr. Google. There's uh, almost 400 million results. So I thought that's not a great idea. Um, so then, in real, realistic terms, here's what we actually do. Um, this is kind of a Lane Library resource that Dr. Kelly Skeff helped uh, kind of link through the uh, EPIC portal. Um, PubMed, a great area to start with if you're just looking for broad symptoms um, and get gathering information. Case reports, uh, you know, reviews, uh, the literature, really, and I use it uh, extensively. Google Scholar, not bad. It can tell you uh, links to similar articles, how many times that article has been cited, and it gives you a little more information about individual uh, links. And then, of course, uh, the Lane Library itself. I've downloaded numerous, oops, sorry, numerous textbooks um, for diseases and pathology I'm not familiar with, small fiber neuropathy, um, gastric reflux, what are the surgical options, things like that. So thankfully at Stanford, we have a lot of resources and we use them heavily. And the health library has been a huge asset. Um, we often call on the specialists here in this library to help us find case reports, literature. Are there any um, associations between these symptoms and that disease? Um, it's been very helpful. I have a few patients who have a known disease and we were looking for alternative treatments. And uh, the health science library here on the second floor of Hoover uh, was pivotal, very helpful. So for this patient, uh, I met with him numerous times over about six months. Um, between appointments, testing, labs, imaging, pulmonary studies, um, a whole, whole lot of things. He was a trooper. Uh, I was, again, uh, mostly wrong. Nothing was coming up. Um, so I was, uh, I'll be honest, I was kind of stuck. But he was saying, uh, this is really debilitating. So often. Uh, with these cases, it takes time. So I was just um, kind of thinking about them one night. And then I thought, um, OK, what's unique about this patient? And that's also kind of a, a helpful term. Well, he is from uh, a certain part of the, uh, con uh, the continent, kind of the Mediterranean area. And there are genetic syndromes there that can cause weird arthritis and fevers. What if this is an atypical presentation of arthritis and fever? So I sent him for a genetic testing, uh, specifically the uh, MEF uh, V gene. And yeah, it confirmed he has a familial Mediterranean fever. So here, that's a pretty rare diagnosis. But overseas, it's actually not that uncommon. And so they will have typically fever, arthritis, a variety of other symptoms. And in his case, it was pretty unique. It was only pericarditis, inflammation around the heart. But otherwise, he didn't have anything else. So, he was kind of a, a one-off diagnosis as well, and that's what made this case pretty difficult. But he fit all of the classic symptoms, uh, these cyclical, painful episodes, and then goes away for months. Um, so after years of this pain, we start him on colchicine, he's fine, no more attacks. So it's kind of an atypical presentation, even more so that we just don't see it here. Um, it's overseas. He actually did go overseas, and he met with a the doctor there because he wasn't sure if I was right. And they were like, oh yeah, that's totally what it is. And take, take your culture scene. And he, he was fine. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is just a one slide uh, case. Patient with 
15 years of chronic abdominal pain, seen at three different universities, um, really diff I haven't figured this one out fully, um, has all the typical things you expect. Workup for GERD, uh, gastroparesis, celiac disease, gallbladder, of course. Less common things, celiac, um, a, com a artery compression syndrome, uh, a vasculitis is this inflammation of your uh, intestinal um, uh, blood vessels. Porphyria, I sent this one. Um, no other symptoms of porphyria, but it's possible. Uh, we're getting more and more rare. Um, so then, uh, similar to that last patient, I was influenced. Well, where is this patient from? Well, there are certain parasites in that area that can affect only the small bowel, and you wouldn't see um, elsewhere. And so I sent kind of a parasitic workup that's still pending. Um, is this kind of similar to that other patient? Is this a peritonitis? So I sent for genetic testing as well. And then um, this is actually a patient I had mentioned earlier. Going through old images, there is a lesion in the thalamus from 2004. Could this be all a, a thalamic sensory syndrome? And that's kind of the representation, or is this almost like a type of seizure? And so the patient's uh, pending a seizure workup. So these are all possibilities. These could be wrong, or these could be right, and hopefully we cure her from uh, 15 years of uh, abdominal pain. So that's kind of my overview of diagnostic process, what we're thinking of, um, how it proceeds, and I, I think I kind of repeated some of those points, that's reevaluation, time, and thinking. Um, the number one thing, honestly, just such a humbling process, uh, hearing patient stories, acknowledging patients suffer, um, feeling frustrated myself, um, realizing how much there is that I don't know and one person can't know, and that's why it's so important to have a team. Uh, I talk with Brian Lynn, Linda Gang. Um, you know, I send emails with uh, specialists, the Health Science Library, kind of all comprise our team here, and it, it makes a world of difference. Um, key, key features of our clinic, multiple appointments, really testing, retesting, and then consulting with the experts we have here at Stanford. And then uh, we'll do questions at the end, I think. Um, maybe I can pass it off to do uh, programs, great. Great, thank you. Um, it's such a privilege to be here tonight, so thank you all for having us. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about, as a wrap up to the end of our talk, about the Stanford specific programs that we have here. And just to add to the collection of TV shows, I actually haven't seen this one, but in parallel with the Netflix diagnosis show, I don't, has anyone heard of Chasing the Cure or actually seen it? Oh. Um, it's on TBS, TNT, I believe, and Ann Curry, the anchor woman, is leading sort of a, similar along the veins of diagnosis where um, many patients, I believe around the world, if not at least around the country, submit their mystery unsolved uh, medical condition for what they call crowdsourcing, um, really through social media and reaching out to anybody in the public, including you know, any, anybody. You don't have to be a physician to try to help connect with the case. And so I'm curious, I haven't seen it yet, but I like the idea of crowdsourcing because as um, Dr. Latfi was mentioning, it really isn't one person can't know it all. And uh, there's, there's also a lot of biases, and it's funny because it, I think in um, medical training, we're taught to try not to trust anybody, even though we, we trust each other as colleagues. But really, I mean, and we're all surrounded by smart people, but um, they always say, trust no one, even yourself. And so really the follow-up and then the re-evaluation, as Dr. Laffey said, is really important, especially when something doesn't fit. And I think a lot of times when patients come to our clinic, it's because they're really astute, primary physician has noted, Something's not quite right here. Um, I don't know what it is. My mind has already created this idea of what the patient has or maybe doesn't have, but I'm not sure if there's something more outside the box or rare or unusual that I'm missing. And so let's just get more minds on it. And that's really, I think, a really valuable asset to have a team and to crowdsource, uh, or as you will say, collective intellect is so much more powerful. At Stanford, there is a really a spectrum of services that are offered to try to help patients all the way from maybe it is um, that you have a diagnosis even and you just want a second opinion. Um, or maybe, it, and maybe it's not even complex disease, maybe it's rather simple, but really you just want a second opinion. Then there's also uh, consultative medicine, which then we do in-person evaluation for the more um, unusual conditions. Usually patients have already seen several doctors. I've had a patient I just saw who had seen 100 physicians all around the country. So you can see the depth and the actually really prolonged 
uh, odysseys that patients go through to in search of a diagnosis. Um, sometimes patients come with many diagnoses, labels that have already been given to them, maybe because to alleviate the frustration of, I don't know what it is, but maybe I'll just tell you something that could be, but we don't really know. And often I tell my patients, I'm gonna be honest with you, I may not know what it is. I don't wanna to jump to give you, the last thing you need is a misdiagnosis. And it's better to you know, not, be, not know the answer than to give you a wrong answer. Because I, I think we both also seen iatrogenesis and then the consequences of medically induced harm. Um, and getting the correct diagnosis is very important to get the right treatment. And so, so we see people in the clinical setting. And then uh, beyond that, there's a, a small portion that, as Dr. Lafi had mentioned, maybe the disease is truly unknown and previously not described. And that's where the Stanford Center for Undiagnosed Diseases and the Undiagnosed Disease Network, which I'll mention in just a minute, really comes to play. This is entering into the research and discovery realm. And uh, there was actually a talk in February from the SHC library that doctors um, Matthew Wheeler and John Bernstein, who run our Center for Undiagnosed Diseases, had given about the UDN. So you may be already familiar with that. A little bit more detail about each of the spectrum. So the Stanford's online second opinion service actually just recently started in the last couple of years. And um, it brings to, I just wanted to make this point is, I think a lot of times people think about second opinions as for a treatment, you know, maybe a cancer treatment that you want a second opinion about or surgery before you undergo, uh, you know, go into the operating room. But like I said, diagnosis is really important. What if you're getting the wrong treatment because you have the wrong diagnosis? And so if you have, um, when should you get a second opinion? One, if it's a serious illness, before you embark on the road or before you really, really think about what the consequences and, and the life altering meaning of this diagnosis, perhaps you should seek a second opinion. If it's a really complex illness, you have multiple organs involved, um, lots of different symptoms, that's also somewhere where multiple um, eyes on the case are valuable. A rare diagnosis, as Dr. Latfi mentioned, because especially, for example, at Stanford, we have um, centers that are uh, centers of excellence for extremely rare you know, conditions that a lot of times actually in the community, um, in community hospitals, for example, they don't see this very often and it's very difficult for them to diagnose it because if you don't see it often, then you may not recognize the spectrum of that um, diagnostic uh, disease. And so, for example, we have amyloid center here. We have uh, experts in mastocytosis and HLH. I mean, these are things that are rarely seen. But if you come and see the right physician or come see, you know, for example, we are connected with them. So in a way, we're a portal to these experts. And we know getting you to the right expert is really important. And then um, uncertain diagnosis, meaning you know, maybe somebody had given you diagnosis, but they're just saying, I think that's what it is. I'm not 100% sure. Well, then that's probably a place where uh, you and your physician may discuss about um, a second opinion. Oftentimes, I'll have patients feel bad or say, I, will my doctor get offended? But I think we're, we're all, you know, we know our limitations as well. And if your physician is again, I mean, I think, you know, it speaks to your physician that usually we're humble enough to know that it's important to you and it's you have every right to do so. And I encourage patients, especially if they fall under this categories, to get a second opinion. And so the Stanford Online, what, how that works is a patient actually anywhere in the world, because this is all digital, so there's no face-to-face -face interaction in this kind of format, is uh, they submit their case uh, through the portal on Stanford's online. Um, so you can just Google Stanford Online Second Opinion if you look right here. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Oh, but if there's a website, if you just Google Stanford Medicine Online Second Opinion Program, and then um, what happens is they'll uh, for Stanford they'll collect your medical records, digitize everything, and then submit it to the appropriate physician. So that could be you know if you want a second opinion on, from a cardiologist for your cardiac condition. That's great, and then if, if it actually happens to be falling in the sort of complex undiagnosed realm, that may come to one of us, and we would look over your records, and then provide, and you have certain questions that want to be answered, and then provide a digital second opinion that goes back to you in a digital format. Um, but again, there's no face-to-face -face interaction, and typically there are for more simple cases where um, you know, it's not decades of something, uh, it's not, unusual physical exam findings because again, the value of seeing the patient and interacting with the patient, hearing their story firsthand and examining the patient is so important. And so that's where um, the consultative medicine clinic really is about 
in person, in depth. And usually we see patients that are referred by another provider, like I said, who've had that intuitive um, kind of light bulb go off and say, there's something a little unusual about this case. Could you please evaluate this? Maybe it's just to make sure I'm not missing anything, or maybe um, if you can go deeper and is there something rare or undiagnosed. And we do an in-depth medical review of the records. And then the case evaluation, this is where I, I think it's really the strength of Stanford, but also it speaks to really the in-depth nature, uh, multidisciplinary and resource intensive efforts that we go to, to try to um, you know, solve some of the most difficult cases. And that includes um, where minds come together, as Dr. Laffey mentioned, a clinical case conference where we talk with each other, um, bounce ideas, collective intelligence, and then also artificial intelligence. We actually, there are out there um, artificial, computers are very smart at pattern recognition. Um, and so they, there are multiple programs out there that we actually utilize to assist us. They often help in expanding your differential diagnosis, meaning you, you know, maybe uh, describe your patient and then the computer will help generate new ideas for you. They often don't help in trying to narrow the diagnosis. Um, and then, of course, as we mentioned, the deep literature search that the health library has uh, very been very valuable in, in helping us with. And then advanced laboratory testing as well, meaning um, sometimes, you know, especially if you're doing tests that um, maybe if you're a generalist, you may not be as comfortable with unless you're a specialist or have had experience running that test again. Because again, every test you run, you need to be able to interpret. And if you're not comfortable doing that, Act, like with good confidence, then that might, you know, you, you probably shouldn't be running that lab test. And so here we're lucky that we have so many resources and experts to, to actually help us with those um, interpretations if needed as well. And for example, we have a clinical genomics uh, consultation program. And so if we wanted to run um, a really high tech kind of whole exome sequencing on somebody and do really high tech sequencing, when we think it's a genetic condition, that's something that we would be capable of doing in the clinical realm even with a genetic counselor, et cetera. And then finally, very um, really uh, an amazing Stanford resource is a tool that's been developed here by um, Stanford researchers is a bioinformatics analysis where they find patients like you. And so you input parameters about this patient and it searches through the last 10 years of our entire Stanford records and also another set of, I, I believe like a million patients uh, from another data set. And they try to find another patient because as we mentioned, the patients that we encounter are, um, you know, they have unusual conditions. And so it's not common to say, well, who else has seen a patient just like this? And that's where technology and bioinformatics has really helped us. Because once you can find other patients, you can ask questions like, what happened to those patients? Um, what kind of treatments? And what was their ultimate diagnosis? And provide clues for you. But I think the, uh, the point of this slide really is that once a case comes to us, it becomes a project. It becomes you know, a, a journey that we partner with their primary doctors and with the patient um, to continue. And eventually there'll be follow-up as well. Follow-up is really important, as Dr. Laffey mentioned, both for something to declare itself, but also so we can learn from it. Um, I've learned from many of my own cases as well when I've looked back and said, what happened to that patient that I saw that one night? And I was like, oh, I thought that's what it was, but I was uh, incorrect. Or maybe I was correct, but you help to develop your own experience pool. And I think in tackling difficult diagnosis, really the perfect balance is the openness of a beginner's mind. So like medical students, they, they think of everything under the sun when you ask them, what do you think the shortness of breath could be? Um, but also with the wisdom and experience of someone who has had you know, mistakes to learn from and has seen many things. Um, so the humility and openness and actually curiosity, but also breadth of um, ideas and matched with sort of the wisdom and experience. And so uh, finally, at the sort of end of that spectrum, as I mentioned, the Stanford UDN is part of an entire network. And I encourage you to look at that, um, uh, the February talk um, from Drs. Wheeler and Bernstein. But Stanford is part of that. And so, for example, our consultative medicine clinic can refer you know, a subset of patients who may fit this. And what they really do is, uh, for a very a small group of select patients uh, who are accepted into this program, the Undiagnosed Diseases Network, 
um, it's an NIH spawned research, um, uh, clinical research en endeavor. And so it started in the National Institutes of Health and now is a network across, um, you know, about 13 sites across the country from academic institutions. Stanford was one of the original ones, uh, part of the network. And there, once they, you know, these are patients who have seen physicians like us in the consultative medicine clinic or Mayo Clinic or, you know, um, other sub major academic medical centers and still have like, basically come to um, an undiagnosed condition. And, and it's thought that, hypothesized that they probably have an undescribed condition, a novel disease. And so there it's really about using um, non-clinically available or, you know, cutting edge technologies to try to figure out the pathophysiology and the mechanisms, the genetics, the molecular, the immunology of it all. So, um, and that's all part of the Stanford spectrum of um, services and programs that are available for patients who have mystery, complex, and um, undiagnosed disease. So, I think that is it. So, thank you so much. And I believe it's Q&A. Yeah. Thank you.